with the president. The United States of America is coming to terms with a new president and a new era. But how did America elect such a divisive figure? And what can its conflicted history tell us about a troubled here and now? As the big picture previously documented in The People vs. America, appeals to race and populism are old strategies used by presidents from Richard Nixon to Bill Clinton. In this episode, we trace the growing distrust of established authority in 21st century America, despite one president promising security and another promising change. America's ready for a fresh start after a season of cynicism. In November 2000, the United States was looking for a new president for the start of a new millennium. The race between the Democratic vice president, Al Gore, and the Republican governor of Texas, George W. Bush, would be one of the closest elections in U.S. history and one of the most controversial. The 2000 election was a moment in which for a lot of people, trust and belief, faith in the electoral system was eroded pretty dramatically. With neither candidate able to establish a lead, the presidential election would be decided by whoever won the state of Florida. The governor, Jeb Bush, whose brother George W. Bush was running for president, had hired a firm to scrub the voter rolls the goal was to remove felons who, under Florida law, even once you've served your term for a felony, you still do not have your voting rights restored in Florida. And subsequent investigations showed very clearly that several thousand of the people who had been scrubbed were wrongly scrubbed. These voters who were expunged were overwhelmingly African American. African Americans, of course, vote 90% plus for the Democratic Party. A first count of votes gave George W. Bush a marginal victory, automatically triggering a machine recount. This is ballot eight. A second manual recount would see the Republican side appeal to the Supreme Court to stop the recount process, eventually handing the White House to George W. Bush. Many people believe he stole the election through the political power, number one, of his brother, who was the governor of Florida, and then the fact that he had a Supreme Court which handed the election to him. In many ways, it's, it's, it's an eternal shame on the United States. Within a year of George W. Bush taking office, the United States would be rocked by the attacks of September 11th, 2001. A president who had assumed power under a cloud of uncertainty now found new poise and a new purpose. Freedom and fear are at war. The advance of human freedom now depends on us. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. He instantly became extraordinarily popular um, and was able to make the war on terror and the possibility or the, the, the probability that if Americans were not ever vigilant, we would suffer more horrific attacks. Vigilance would extend to domestic surveillance. The Bush administration granted new powers for U.S. security services to spy on U.S. citizens. 9-11 was used as an excuse to justify a extraordinary expansion of secret power under the mantle of national security. Thomas Drake was a senior analyst with the National Security Agency, the NSA, at the time of the September 11th attacks. What the government did right after 9-11 was license unto itself the ability to create national security law. 
exempting itself from the constraints of the Constitution and all, all, literally all statutes that governed its activities up to that point. In the deepest of secrecy and partnership and with the approval of the White House, NSA employed a program called Stellar Wind. Stellar Wind was the mass domestic surveillance program. Stellar Wind was the code name for what was officially known as the President's Surveillance Program. It involved the mining of data, telephone, email, and internet activity, as well as financial transactions of Americans by their government. So you're willing to set aside the very form of governance that makes the American experience unique, that gave rise to the American dream, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're gonna turn our country inside out. We're gonna make everything suspicious or possibly suspicious because we have to for the sake of national security. You have big appeals to fear and there's a whole other dimension to this. It's not only not trusting institutions and not trusting the government, but also not trusting the person next door. In addition to that, you had the Patriot Act. Uh, you ha had, um, you know, more and more laws that give the executive more and more power. You invoke a terrifying internal and external threat, like the global war on terror. It's a thing, terrorism is a thing, but it's a crime. It's a set of crimes, there are laws to deal with it. You don't need to close down a civil society to deal with them. New legislation, such as the Patriot Act, and new bodies, such as the Department of Homeland Security, while set up to protect America, were, according to their critics, compromising the civil liberties of the American people. The continuing threat of terrorism, the threat of mass murder on our own soil, will be met with a unified, effective response. Even 1% insecurity is too much. In late 2001, Zhenya Wickett helped launch the Bush administration's Office of Homeland Security Affairs. The idea that anything was too much, that we needed to protect ourselves 100%, and of course this was impossible, but that sentiment really um, defined in many respects how uh, homeland security was thought of at the beginning. President Bush would seek retribution for the attacks against the U.S. homeland by executing a so-called war on terror. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq would alienate sections of the Muslim world. Despite attempts to claim otherwise, many Muslims, including American Muslims, would see the so-called war on terror as a war on them. The demonization of Muslims after 9-11 is certainly one of the most important political stories of this era. They were already a kind of demon figure uh, in American political culture. The sort of entire foreign policy that George W. Bush ended up prosecuting only, I, th I think, only reinforced the demonization of Islam and of Muslims, including the United States. As America's racial politics took on a new form, the devastation wrought by Hurricane Katrina across southern states in August of 2005 would reveal stubborn divisions of old and expose a president as out of touch with the people. He was already unpopular, and then Katrina hit, and the response to it, well, first of all, the visual images of the utter destruction of New Orleans um, the loss of life, and what seemed to be the utterly incompetent response by the federal government. It exposed stunning indifference to the fate of people there, you know, because they were poor, because they were black. Katrina fit a larger narrative, that this is a government that didn't really care about ordinary people, that didn't have the time to focus on immediate needs domestically because it was so busy prosecuting what by then were unpopular wars overseas. In 2000, George W. Bush had come to power having lost the popular vote. 
eight years later, an unpopular president who'd been marked by unpopular policies would leave office just as a calamitous financial meltdown sent shockwaves throughout the United States. America needed hope and called for change. Those calls would be answered by an unlikely new leader. Because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. Obama was exciting because he was eloquent, he was African-American, he was an intellectual uh, and a professor, and that was important too. It seemed like uh, really the harbinger of something really new. It didn't occur to anyone that one of the reasons that Obama could even get this far was that he had to be totally, totally immersed in and protected by a very big, I can say, cartel of rich people who thought, here's what we can do. Obama spent two years, only two years in the Senate. His voting record, which is the only thing that should have counted, was a one corporate giveaway after another. Obama got in, and he's the pawn of, you know, globalized interests, you know. I mean, the problem is not left or right. The problem is that whoever's in the White House has very little room to move. Often a shock is required for a political change to occur. And it was said of Obama when he came to office that had Bush, George W. Bush, not been such a failure as a president, seen that way, America would have never taken this step. America wouldn't have been ready. You know, for some of us, uh, Obama is just uh, a black face. He was the guy that everybody thought was the great black hope, and he ended up bailing out banks as his first act of, uh, as president. I mean, everybody black in America was like, did I hear him say he's gonna bail out banks? And says things like, the banks are too big to fail. I mean, this is the first thing we heard from Obama um, I'll never forget uh, when Obama was coming up in the polls in the primary, you, you probably remember this, um, but uh, somebody was interviewing Jesse Jackson about it, and there was a hot mic, and <laughs> they go up to commercial, but the mic is still on, and yeah. Jesse Jackson just sits there and he mumbles under his breath, I want to cut his balls off. Right. And, you know, that summarizes a lot of what Obama represents. He represents a guy who's playing the game of political advancement by, in some ways, sacrificing black political interests. Um, and it's a dilemma that black politicians inherently have. Um, unless, in, you know, we do have residential segregation in the United States, we have long histories of that, which means that our representative system makes it possible for black politicians to emerge from overwhelmingly black districts. Um, but once you want to move on to uh, a position that is representing people who aren't just black, and that means if you want to be a senator, right. it means if you want to be a governor, it usually means if you want to be a mayor, and certainly if you want to be president, then you have to perform a certain type of legitimacy. Um, for Obama, um, you know, he certainly did not roll any of that stuff back, but I think a key part of his performance was defending Wall Street. From my perspective, Obama represented the same controlling cartel in America, he had no differences. He certainly didn't talk about black people, very rarely talked about black people, certainly did nothing in terms of mass incarceration, nothing in terms of poverty. He would go to these black colleges, Morehouse and Howard, he would say, look at these black men. You're not taking care of your, you're not responsible. You're going to jail, you're not taking care of your children. And so black people were like, were thinking, this is it for us. I mean, we really wanted him to be president. And then we started saying things like, well, you know, it's like, um, you know, well, he's not the black president. He's the president for all people, so we have to give him a chance. And we need to elect him one more time, too, and give him another chance. But uh, I don't think that the Obama election is the triggering point. I think the shift from industrial life to technology is the bigger the bigger issue. I don't think it's because of Obama. That's, that's what I think, anyway. I think that there are two pieces to this. Um, one piece... I see entirely what Elaine is saying. The, the basic problem for black politics in the United States is that in an electoral arena, you still have to win white votes. And that usually entails a strong performance of being acceptable. And one of the most prominent ways to demonstrate <laughs> your performance is to lock black people up. And if you look at Obama's history, he got in the state Senate 
through gerrymandering. And he gerrymandered his district to include rich white people. Obama did nothing to disturb anybody at all. We hardly know he was president. Uh, certainly, but much less do we know he's black. Even black people who were just, did not want anybody white to think that we wouldn't like Obama. We just had to say we loved Obama. And we're embarrassed to let white people know that we really are disappointed in Obama. That's the, that's the nicest thing that some people can say is that they're disappointed in Obama. Obama continued the war, didn't even empty out a few prisons, didn't do anything about Guantanamo said nothing about poverty, racism, anything. He did, he just sat out eight years. I take all your points on all of the various different uh, reasons how things get put together. But when one looks at it from the outside, is that just the cumulative result of the kinds of things that we've been talking about? Identity politics, squeezing of the working class, the, the loss of what you call social honor in the Rust Belt states. I think while we can have one conversation about how system disturbing Obama was or wasn't, um, and I certainly lean to the side that he was not system disturbing, but there's another conversation about how many whites in particular perceived him. Um, and I do think many whites perceived Obama as uniquely threatening and disturbing to their sense of identity and sense of self. And this is where a sort of liberal analysis that all those whites are racist, I think have oversimplified the matter. Lots of those white voters in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan voted for Obama in 2008. Exactly. They voted for Obama in 2012. In Michigan, they voted overwhelmingly for Obama in part because he saved the auto industry. Let me say one more thing about that. We underestimate Obama as a Rust Belt politician. You pointed out that he bailed out the auto industry. Obama himself, immediately after right. the election, he said, look, you know, I went to Ohio not because of the magic of my charisma. I went down there to every fish fry, visited every VFW hall. I did that work. When he was senator of Illinois, he held town halls all over the state, which he says was instrumental in him forming an agenda to speak to the people that he had never met, which were white working class people in the Rust Belt. Barack Obama's presidency began with the fallout from the 2008 credit crash, a crisis that had begun with an unfettered banking sector issuing loans to people ill-equipped to make repayments, and then trading those toxic debts was on the brink of dismantling America's financial foundations. President Obama faced a choice, save the banks that caused the problem or support the American people suffering the consequences. Ron Suskind writes a book about the crisis, and he recounts a meeting right after Obama takes office in 2009 with all of the leading bankers. And Obama tells them, it's, I'm all that stands between you and the pitchforks. And he makes it very clear that he is not going to go after Wall Street. And he doesn't. And he brings in his brain trust, which includes Lawrence Summers, Clinton's former uh, Treasury Secretary, who, along with Robert Rubin and a few others, orchestrated this meltdown. In 1999, Robert Rubin and Lawrence Summers, successive Treasury Secretaries in the Clinton administration, and both with connections to Wall Street banks, led the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. That law had, in the wake of the 1929 Wall Street crash, forced banks to keep their investment and commercial activities separate, stopping them betting with the deposits of ordinary citizens. When it came to fixing the problems of the 2008 crash, initially brought about by banks gambling with the mortgages of millions of Americans, President Obama turned to the very men who had helped make that gamble possible. Well, it goes back to destroying Glass-Steagall. So it destroys, you know, financial regulations. <laughs> that financialization of the economy was pushed forward by people like Summers. Barack Obama looked to ensure that the $700 billion bailout plan enacted by his predecessor, George W. Bush, was pushed through to save the banks threatened by a collapse of their own making. Washington was enthralled to Wall Street. Even the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, was skewed in big money's favor. Proposed in 1929 by lawyer Ferdinand Pecora, the SEC was to implement controls to safeguard the people from the excesses and corruptions 
of the finance industry. What Pecora said is, if we ever loosen those controls, if we loosen them and let, let it back out of its cage, it'll do the same thing all over again because it is uh, in its DNA. It's in the bank's DNA to run amok if you let them run amok. In 2009, President Obama tasked the SEC with investigating how the banks had run amok with such devastating effect. His appointments would lay bare the compromise and conflict running through U.S. governance. He brings in Mary Shapiro, who is at the heart of Wall Street. Her credentials for being among Wall Street elite are unimpeachable. She's 100% pure blue blood Wall Street. And then she hires Kusami to head enforcement. Robert Kusami had been general counsel for Deutsche Bank in the US, helping the German giant unleash the toxic financial instruments that helped create the 2008 crisis. By the following year, Kusami was at the Securities and Exchange Commission leading the investigation into the crisis. Today's action is about holding individuals accountable. If you wanted to pick someone who would have to go soft on Wall Street, you couldn't do any better than Robert Kusami because if he put together a list of the top 10 people for him to pursue, he would have to be on that list. With Kuzami in place, the team tackling the corruptions of high finance would have one more appointment before it was complete. We still have another office to fill. And that office is the cop, the actual cop of Wall Street, the US attorney for the Southern District of New York. So Preet Bharara is selected for that role. Now Preet Bharara is the former right-hand man for Senator Schumer, the tax man for the Senate Finance Committee to fund Senate races. That's him. So he's owned by Wall Street. So any progress against Wall Street is dead on arrival. According to the Senate Investigations Committee, the uh, financial fraud and crimes of the crisis cost the U.S. $21 trillion. Nobody from Wall Street goes to prison. Nobody. No one. When it came to checking and punishing the wrongs of corporate power, far from bringing change to America, President Obama ensured it would be business as usual. The good of the few still came before the good of the many. America was on the cusp of a popular revolt that would unite and divide the American people once again. The U.S. was struggling in the wake of a financial crisis that exposed the deep ties between government and systemic corporate greed, leaving the American people to suffer the costs. The economic situation creates a huge amount of insecurity, uh, a very large sense that um, America is no longer working for the American people as a whole. The people who caused the problem got bailed out to the tune of billions and billions and billions, where the ordinary homeowner, no help for them whatsoever. And that fueled so much anger. It fueled anger on the right and the left. How many times do we have to dig in our pocket? On the left, the Occupy movement would look to challenge Wall Street's might and America's income inequality turning the fact of wealth concentration in an elite 1% of the population into a mobilizing battle cry. For the right, the backlash against government policies would find form in a new entity cut from familiar cloth. We're sending a message to Washington. 
Obama Pelosi Reed spending spree is over, you're fired. The Tea Party really was a right wing formation um, that opposed the idea that the government should step in uh, and spend this kind of money to bail out people who didn't deserve to be, to be bailed out. There were other elements of the Tea Party that were clearly steeped in what I would describe as racial resentment. It's older white people who feel that they're the ones getting shafted. These people sort of see themselves as standing in line, waiting, and suffering a lot from the recession. But then some people cut in line in front of them, completely illegitimately in their view. It became about immigrants. It became about Muslims. It became about liberals. But it was a movement that realized that its own political establishment in the Republican Party had sold it out. In 2013, former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden showed that the intelligence establishment had sold out the American people en masse. Obama embraced the policies of mass surveillance, uh, extended them, and entrenched them. Snowden revealed how the security services were still snooping on U.S. citizens by accessing telephone records and compelling communications companies to release their user data. The American deep state was continuing its program of domestic surveillance. Every totalitarian state has a secret police or a surveillance society. The state, you know, watches the privacy of citizens. Um, you start to target whistleblowers. Snowden's revelations would see him charged under the Espionage Act, originally enacted in 1917 to punish dissenters and spies during the First World War. Only three people had ever been prosecuted using the statute prior to President Obama taking office. By the time he would leave the White House, the Espionage Act would be invoked against a further eight U.S. citizens accused of leaking classified information. He's used the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers. He signed into law Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which overturns the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibited the US military from carrying out domestic policing. And I sued him in federal court over this. It's called Hedges versus Obama. In January of 2012, journalist Chris Hedges challenged the legality of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. The act allowed for the indefinite military detention of US citizens without trial, with no charges against them and no evidence of a crime having been committed. After winning the initial case in the Southern District Court of New York, the decision was overturned on appeal, a reversal supported by the Supreme Court. I was in the courtroom in downtown New York, and I heard with my own ears Obama's lawyers say to Judge Forrest when she said, does this mean that you, the president can arrest a reporter for interviewing a member of Al-Qaeda, right? Just interviewing, which is what reporters are supposed to do. Um, the lawyer said, yes, we can arrest Chris Hedges. We can hold him forever without charge or trial. It, it, in essence, allows the U.S. government to carry out extraordinary rendition on the streets of American cities. And these people have no legal recourse. They uh, understand the increasingly deadly effects of climate change. They understand the blowback that, uh, that economic stagnation will create. They, I think, have to have on the radar another financial meltdown. We allowed Wall Street to go back and do what they did before. And they don't trust the police to protect them. They want to be able to use the military as a mechanism. We've already militarized our police forces. They want to use the military as a mechanism of last resort. And now legally they can. As President Obama approached the end of his two terms in office, a divided United States, mired in growing inequality, conflicting politics, and competing identities, seemed to be battening down the hatches as it prepared to face an historic choice for a new leader elect its first woman president, another Clinton, or a billionaire TV reality show host with no experience of public office. 
America would choose the billionaire. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. He was trying to talk to what Nick, Richard Nixon called the silent majority of native-born Americans. He didn't call them all white Americans, but Americans who felt that the country had been theirs and it was getting away from them. This is the rage of white people who were, had great industrial jobs while they excluded many blacks and other people of color from those industrial jobs. The shift from industrial an industrial economic base to a technology-driven economic base is what has happened, period. And the white people who have benefited from industrial work, who are now not benefiting, are finally uh, feeling the same kind of pain that black and poor people have been feeling uh, for lo these many uh, years. So what is happening is not about Trump, it's not even anti-establishment per se, because they didn't argue this question when they had a work. The 2016 presidential election polarized the nation and bloodied the noses of mainstream candidates, both Republican and Democrat. Donald J. Trump, a property tycoon and TV celebrity who'd criticized the Washington elite for being out of touch with ordinary Americans, who'd alienated black, Hispanic, and Muslim voters, offended women, and dithered in renouncing the support of the Ku Klux Klan, was president of the United States of America. If you were building in a laboratory a candidate who would be, who would perfectly appeal to authoritarian voters, Donald Trump would be the guy you would build in the laboratory. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. When we talk about authoritarianism, uh, we're talking about a psychological mindset that tends to see the world in black and white in ethnocentric terms, to want clear answers to complicated problems, to want strong leaders to sort of impose their will to maintain the social order. The crime and the gangs and the drugs, this American carnage stops right here and stops right now. Appeals to a swathe of white America feeling dispossessed of status and failed by a government class allied with corporate forces, once more brought in a president promising tougher law and greater order. It's just another rise of, of white people thinking that this is their country and being sold on that. Uh, Donald Trump is really not the issue. Just as others, from Richard Nixon to Ronald Reagan to Bill Clinton, had made coded appeals to a supposed silent majority of white Americans, for many, Donald Trump spoke directly to the same constituency yearning for a lost era. White America has retreated into this mythical past. They bought into this belief that somehow if we can bring that past back, we will have moral renewal and glory and vengeance against the forces that have turned against us. What they don't want to realize or think about is, well, that, that period of time also depended on redlining and segregation and extreme poverty in certain places and pollution and the subjugation of slave states and other nations and all this stuff that supported that 30 or 40 years of American happiness was, was predicated on a lot of pain for a lot of other people in a lot of other places. The revulsion at the system is so intense that you're willing to essentially use these figures as a way to express your utter disgust for a system which has betrayed you. So you become the ultimate Trumpist. Yeah, the blacks are out to get me, the Jews are out to get me, the Mexicans are coming and raping our children and immigrating. So it pulls you along the same way the American dream pulled you along, only the American dream was pulling you along to a fantasy of wealth and contentment, where this is pulling you along to a, a dream of apocalypse. Every once in a while, people come forward with an isolationist policy. The funny thing is, it wasn't really described this way. 
during the Trump campaign. People used a lot of different words to describe it, but this really is a recurrence of an iso isolationist tendency, is it not? Donald Trump appealed to a certain population and made them feel that now that in the absence of, in of industrial work uh, and the rise of technology uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, proliferation, we can say, of more and more people of color uh, in America, I'm your guy, I'm going to take you back to those good old days. Uh, sort of the way Hitler appealed to the poor Germans um, and saying, listen, the problem is, you know, the Romani, the Jew, the homosexual, what have you. Um, it's the same thing. So um, for, from my perspective, um, these differences are really just a shift in perspective at this moment, but the fundamental uh, the fundamental institutions are in place and are behaving pretty much uh, the way they would be predicted. It's probably important to keep in mind we saw a reemergence of a type of sectarianism that we haven't seen in American politics in a while. What we're seeing is a new kind of sectarianism, though, which is organized around places that are doing very poorly in a global context, and this would be the industrial Midwest. Um, and Donald Trump has made very direct plays to them, and I think that the idea of isolation matters a lot there. And I understand that. I mean, no one's giving Donald Trump credit for inventing a yes. political approach. But it, it, it seems to me that with the use of coded language, and mm -hmm. people have always had codes yes. at one stage or another, but it seems to be so much more obvious now. Do you think there's anything there? I do, and I actually think Trump was not so concerned about even using coded language anymore. Um, and I think one of the upsetting things from a liberal perspective, perhaps not from a more radical perspective, from, but from a liberal perspective, is throwing out that coded language and that subtlety and that nicety uh, worked just fine for him. But I don't care if we're polite about being racist or not. And in many ways, some of us are, are saying, well, the, the black now who's been so comfortable with Obama, the Congressional Black Caucus, which has been having their little annual ball every year, just thinking life is going to go on and not worrying about 50% black population in, in the prisons, not worrying about the poverty levels, the education levels of black people or any other group of people. The cotillions are over. Now you recognize that you're back with the rest of us. And so there's a part of Donald Trump, not that we support this, but there's a part of it that says, okay, it's clear now. Now we know where America really is. And it's always been that way. And, and we welcome clarity because now there's no more mistaking, pretending that you really had some like Black Lives Matter. You really, really cared about black people. When we say you, we mean white people. You welcome the end of the hypocrisy. I do. There are two pieces to this. Um, one is, is the country as a whole moving to the right? Um, Certainly, traditionally, Republican counties are becoming much more willing to support an overtly racist candidate. But the other piece of it is, which part matters politically now? None of those places matter politically now, because all of those places were assumed to be Republican anyway. They weren't delivering a presidency to a Republican candidate. The places that flipped were Rust Belt counties. And those are Rust Belt counties that not only went for Obama, many of them went huge for Obama. Um, I don't think the country has fundamentally changed. There's some style differences, but a lot of this comes because people are poor and they finally have somebody at least addressing it, even no matter how false, how crazy, how, how disconnected Trump might actually be to working class white people or working class people of any kind. The bottom line is the country has not moved uh, to the right as far as, um, from my perspective, it is, maintained, uh, it is maintaining itself. And then there are these fundamental questions of people really not having work. The tire company, gone. Coal mining, gone. Let's get with the real program. It's, these jobs don't exist, and these people have been living and dying on the idea that even if I get black lung disease, I'm guaranteed generation upon generation a job. And Donald Trump says, I'm going to help you to bring this back and, you know, all those kinds of, all the rhetoric that, that he has nothing to do with. I'm sorry. No, no, I just, Elaine, yeah. just to add to one thing you're saying on the question of continuity versus change. Of course, Trump in November of 2016 won a presidential election by attacking elites. And in fact, the story of Hillary Clinton's speeches to Goldman Sachs <laughs> as an example of what an are. elite banker-friendly politician she was became part of the campaign 
And then within weeks of Trump winning in November of 2016, he turned around and populated his cabinet with as many Goldman Sachs, Sachs people <laughs> as any administration we've ever seen. Right. So, I mean, if there's one thread <laughs> through recent American history, it's it seems Sachs. to be Goldman Sachs. The, the one piece I would add to that conversation is, did anything change? Were we always this dumb? <laughs> and um, I actually think the answer is no. It is about the way American governance used to be organized. Um, local government used to matter a lot. Um, when people were extending um, their politics from the local to the national, they did so through their unions, they did so through their civic associations, and they did so through their parties, which were actually organizations once. Now they're networks of donors and political operatives. Just a, one other thought. Sinclair Lewis was an American writer. And he said that when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in a flag and carrying a cross. Trump uses the flag, but he's wrapped in a tailored suit, and he carries breath mitts, he says, not exactly carrying a cross. Is that what this is, a step towards fascism, dressed up slightly differently than even the pessimists had predicted? What do you say? Yes. The saving grace is that Trump doesn't know that he's a fascists, um, or doesn't seem to have the strategic sensibility to be one. But I think a lot of people around him do. Um, and he certainly empowered a lot of these people. Um, I don't think it had to be wrapped in the cross anymore or carrying a cross anymore. One, because it turns out that evangelicals weren't that interested in the cross in the first place. As it turns out. As it turns out. <laughs> so what were they interested in? Well, probably a lot of things that Jonathan talks about um, authoritarianism, um, it, which gets expressed as a form of family values that gets discussed a lot uh, in those places. But um, what they're really interested in is the license to discriminate. Uh, I think actually it was very much an undertold story of the 2016 election that at a certain point, evangelicals, in addition to the fact that in some ways they care less about um, personal social conduct than they once purported to, uh, that Donald Trump actually made them the one promise they care most about. I am going to appoint people to the Supreme Court who will overturn Roe v. Wade and will accomplish the things that you evangelicals have been fighting for for almost half a century. I want to say one thing, though. Um, I think what uh, Trump has done is forced us to have to look at who we want to be. And I think that people who I think that it's an opportunity for a movement to arise. And I believe that um, there will be space for us to organize. And if that means, you know, um, being repressed and so forth, well, that we certainly know that might mean being repressed, but that's all right because we at least will be inspired to fight again, whereas we have not been inspired under Obama and Clinton. We've been just idling along and letting things happen. I think that people will be looking for a voice that will say, wait a minute, this is a moment in time. We might want to seize this moment and talk about a complete transformation or a revolutionary change in America. I'm saying that we've been drifting along for a long time now, and this may be uh, an opportunity. Maybe it won't be, but we're going to see. And I, I'd, rather, I'd rather vote for the people and the masses of people than to vote for Donald Trump. We've had so much optimism about this country and the promise that it represents. And we've had generations of Americans believing that they could achieve the American dream if they worked hard. And now people are much more skeptical. There's an elite third where kids are growing up in affluent homes, they're going to good schools, and they're going to college. Then there's a middle third that's struggling. They're doing OK, but they still have the feeling that even if they're not living paycheck to paycheck, one serious health crisis, one serious calamity could undermine everything they've worked for. And then there's a bottom third, which increasingly seems like it's just in hopeless circumstances. We have shifted from an economic system in which the middle class was getting bigger and bigger, uh, the extremes were shrinking, and income and wealth inequality were going down. 
When it started out, it was a story about 80% and the 20%, and then it became the 90 and the 10, and then the 99 and the 1, and now the 99.99 and the 0.001. The only way this is going to change is when the masses of people make the decision to change it. Masses of American people elected Donald Trump as their president. Masses of people also took to the streets to protest against the new president's policies and challenge his legitimacy. But as President Trump looks to enact many of his campaign pledges, including tighter immigration controls, renegotiating trade agreements, and bolstering the conservative core of institutional power, the promise to drain the swamp and purge Washington of elite self-interest seems to have been forgotten. The Trump administration boasts billionaires and establishment figures who, far from reflecting the populist will for change, represent a continuation of a traditional order, decades in the making. This distinction between this individual president and that individual president, they are there to protect the interests of the American government as it exists in service to the American corporations. Our capitalist democracy, which had already created systems by which most of the marginalized, in particular people of color, had very little say in governance and in their own capacity to assert themselves within the society, really seized up. That's what happened. And that's very dangerous, because when your state is unable to respond in a rational way to legitimate grievances, it gives rise to extremism. We end up, you know, further, further atomized and participating really in an economic showdown between these behemoth companies, fighting over the scraps of what's becoming a failed civilization. You know, and, and we all sense it, you know, but it's just, it's very hard to see the enemy as programmatic rather than some caricatured individual that we can hate. Donald Trump, you know, was a joke. In the same way that, you know, even the Nazi party was a joke. They're not a joke when they take power.